All right. Well, let's um, let's move on to some other topics. We have viewers who are concerned about what might be happening in K-12 or pre-K-12 education. I know that that's an issue that several members of the panel have some background in. Um, we'll give Senator Westrom a chance to catch his breath. Let's look to you, uh, Senator uh, uh, torres Ray, and tell us a little bit about where you think education might be going and where you'd like to see it go, uh, uh, K-12 or its equivalent. Well, I think uh, clearly education and health care are, are major uh, points of difference and where most of the budget really is. Uh, almost 90 percent of the budget is in these two bills. Uh, the concerns, I think, are clear. You know, the uh, House presented a budget that is fully funded. Uh, we need about $900 million in order to do that. Um, clearly, uh, we saw in our discussions what will happen as a result of continuing the funding that we have mm -hmm. right now. The cuts to schools are severe uh, in every area of the state of Minnesota, particularly in rural Minnesota. We have, uh, if we uh, pass, you know, the, the funding, if we continue mm -hmm. with the uh, existing funding, uh, we, we see significant cuts. The other problem that we see with uh, and, and has been a problem for the state of Minnesota for a number of years, and we all understand it quite well, is that if we are not able to put funding, state funding, into uh, the K-12 system, what's going to happen is that schools have to rely on levies. And levies means that uh, people have to pass referendums at the local level, increasing, fund, increasing uh, property taxes. Uh, that is very problematic for most of the districts across the state of Minnesota, but particularly for small school districts, for rural districts, where they have not been able to pass their referendums, they have not been able to uh, put the funding in place at the local level, and as a result of it, what is going to happen is that you're going to have to close the schools, and that is a very, very clear uh, situation right now for the state of Minnesota. So. Uh, you know, we, um, I think the, the House proposal was very clear. The, the House wanted to address this problem from the get-go. They put this as a number one priority. It was one of the number, uh, I think it was the number one bill, if I recall correctly, mm -hmm. very early in session. And the Senate decided to go in the opposite direction. And what was most problematic in the Senate was that, you know, I'm in the K-12 Finance Committee from the very beginning. Uh, we move a lot of bills that require funding for which we never, you know, uh, made a decision that we were going to support. And at the end, uh, you know, the committee uh, kept saying, the chair kept saying, well, we'll see when we get a target. We will see when we get a target. Well, there was no intention of putting funding for a target. And that brought us to where we are today. We have no target for K-12. We have no funding which means that we're going to uh, really pass a bill that will cut funding for local districts. Senator Westrom, what's your uh, view on uh, K-12 education in the Senate? Well, there is a difference of uh, uh, opinion of what a cut is uh, in state government, uh, because ironically, the Senate bill increases education, K-12 funding as well. And so I would disagree with my uh, colleague that when, when she says there was a cut in one bill and not in the other. Uh, they both had increases. It was a matter of what amount of increase do we have? Uh, the Senate was about 200 to $300 million of increase, and the House, as I recall, was about $900 million. But of course, they backfill their spending with a 2 to $3 billion tax increase, and that did not pass through the Senate. So uh, to spend that much money is requiring a, a gigantic tax increase uh, in the House, and uh, including a 20 cents a gallon gas tax. And so those are some, some of the big differences that are trying to be worked out right now uh, among the leaders. Representative Grunhagen, K-12 education. Well, as, as I said earlier, I was 16 years on the school board, and I was six years as chief negotiator <laughs> with the uh, certified staff. And let me just say this. Uh, some of the hardest working and most dedicated people and caring people I've ever met were in the uh, public education system, especially administrators and teachers. So I do not want to disparage them in any way. But having had that experience, I do see two cost drivers that I think we need to address in the K-12 system in the state of Minnesota. And the first one is the tendency of state and federal government to pass massive reforms, for the most part, 
They call them best practices, but 90% of the time, or 95% of the time, they don't increase academic results. And, out, and they waste billions of dollars that could be used in the classroom with local public school. And again, state and federal experiments. And I'll just say goals 2000, outcome-based education, uh, race to the top, which was under the Obama administration, which I renamed race off an academic and financial cliff, okay? Because they were giving us one-time money to hire people, and then the money was going to go away. So you create ongoing expenses with one-time money. That doesn't, you don't do that in your personal life. We shouldn't be doing that in government. Uh, goals 2000. You know, these, these uh, the profile of learning, which it was a complete academic disaster, that was under a Republican governor, and wasted over a billion dollars to implement that. So what I find, and when I was on the school board, is if the teacher is doing a good job and they're raising academic scores, leave the teacher alone. And what goes on, both at the state and federal level, is we got to try to micromanage what the teacher thinks, does, and says in the classroom. And we don't know uh, what works with some students and doesn't work with the other. They do. And that's why we pay administrators and superintendents. And we waste an awful lot of money, plus we cause a tremendous amount of disruption for the local school di district when we keep with these convoluted experiments that we call best practices that equal the worst results. The second driver. By the way, I can talk two hours and well, we're not going to let you. But, <laughs> well, we'll give you about another 30 seconds. Okay. We'll give you that much. The second driver, and I have an amendment that passed on the House on a bipartisan basis. We have uh, an excessive amount of children being labeled and drugged in special ed in this state. Okay? Now, I have two, a nephew and a, a cousin that are special ed. I do not want to hurt them. Okay, but we have over 170 requirements over and above the federal requirements that have never been evaluated for effectiveness or cost. I have a bill to start that initiation. When we're labeling and drugging 10 to 12 percent of our student body, K-12, and France and other countries label and drug less than one half percent, and these are strong psychotropic drugs that have severe consequences to be developing children. In fact, it can, it can prohibit them from getting into the military. Check with a military recruiter. I've done it every, almost every year. There's, you can't get into the military. And now they want to label and drug uh, preschool children. This is child abuse and insanity. Now, I'm not saying you never do it, but we've gone way too far in popping pills to our, to our children. And to me, there's no, and I'm not saying it's never used, but nothing shows up in an x-ray. This is all subjective, not objective. And, and we Which really does. need to get to the bottom of this. And my bill starts a study to find out why we're doing this to so many children compared to other states or, or other countries. And that drives costs up in schools. I exactly. Mean, that, that is an issue. Representative Salk, your thoughts, K-12. <laughs> um, my, th my thoughts actually start from a completely different starting place. We really still run our schools like we are the paternalistic local people that have run schools forever. And that we still run a system that is oftentimes under the assumptions of making use of cheaper labor. And that process came from, the, from our societal development of we had ladies who had extraordinary intelligence but had only a couple of occupations that they could move into at that time. Teaching was one, healthcare was another. And what has happened is we have almost institutionalized that over time. And we have held salaries down for women in schools. And I don't think that's a direct one-to-one, -one, but I think that that has disincentivized the, the things that you talked about. Because what you said was extraordinarily important and affirming, and yet I taught for, in schools for 10 years in two different states, and there was never what you just talked about, where it was the advocacy of parents and how they're doing. It was more about holding down their salary, their willingness to achieve, their desire to move forward. And I know people will wildly disagree with me on that, 
but it is a it's an arc of things in our school systems we still underpay what we are doing in education take away the fact of it's women or men the fact that we have people that are that are fu functioning at that pay rate in this important societal work and and that we haven't changed it basically percentage of salaries that sort of thing since the 50s and 60s when I was in school or the 70s and 80s when I was teaching in schools we are still in that same model of where society values education and I think that that's a, an important aspect I, I live in a town where there are tremendous alternatives for people that have high skills that they could go to and the biggest place that we lose our high-end staff is to our industries yeah. in town, not to other schools, not to other education. We lose them into industries, and, and that is a very bad trend if we want our schools to be served by the best and the most talented. And Representative Sock, you make my point. If we would stop spending billions of dollars on these experiments that, for the most part, don't work by the state and federal government, and send that money to the local school district and let them give, hey, I did negotiations. I would agree with you almost 100 percent, except that I lived in and taught in that time, and it was a product of the, let's put teachers in a model of having to show high tests. Let's put them in a model of performance and all that sort of thing. And we, we tried to turn them into factory workers yeah. as opposed to letting them be teachers. And a profession. And, and we are t treating them that way. As much as you said that, well, let them go. We didn't do that. We forced them into this production kind of thing, thinking. And it has turned it, that, that balance, that, that process of why you've employed somebody into a very negative experience. And you and I could learn a lot from each other, so maybe <laughs> off so, here. And it's, it's a kumbaya moment. <laughs> You've accomplished something here today. We're getting closer every minute here. All right. Well, we got to cut that out. Okay. So, uh, let's